let's ask ourselves a question. How long has Freemasonry been around? Is it whenever the first lodges are built, the construction of the temple in the Old Testament? Is it simply the beginning of things? Where is Freemasonry's true origin? Now, to understand exactly what I'm getting at, we need to touch on something very specific. And this is the overall basis of this video. Freemasonry is not a religion. It doesn't have a particular theological requirement. In fact, Freemasonry is a life philosophy. Now, that may come into conflict with some of the conspiracy videos that many of us have seen on the internet, or the hearsay that tends to be put on Freemasonry. But the fact of the matter is, Freemasonry is simply a methodology of teaching that capitalizes on a philosophical approach to oneself and to the world. In fact, that's kind of the basis of Freemasonry as a whole. It, we might say, predates the organization because what it represents far outlives and far preceded Freemasonry as an organization. So let's get into this. What is this life philosophy that I'm referring to? Especially so saying that Masonry has no specific religion. The life philosophy of Masonry is represented in the form of labor. Now, when you hear that a Mason is at labor, you have a very specific idea in terms of how that term is used because it tends to allude to a lodge being open. However, in this case, being at labor really means to simply be doing work personally. And what are these works? Well, they are taught through the form of specific duties, things that are meant to be done. Masonically speaking, we do have a duty to three things in order. Those duties, as this might come striking to many, are specifically to God. Now, it is said earlier that Freemasonry does not have a specific religion, and this is true. It doesn't even present its own religion. It permits the expanse of brothers to come to the table with what it is that they already believe, in the sense that Masonry has no room to challenge a person's personal beliefs on a theological level, only in their worldview. So, this duty to God, we would say, comes in immediate conflict, right? Like, uh, a person would assume, oh, well, if you have a duty to divinity, then you have a specific divinity. Not so, because the duty to God is open in that it is what a person is supposed to do holding on to their own theological standings. If, let's say, in Judaism, your duty to God involves the various practices, the keeping of the festivals, keeping Shabbat, kosher, etc., then that is, in fact, the duty to God. And if you were Christian and you saw that it was important to spread your faith, then that is also a duty to God. Extreme ideologies are actually not accepted. So I should say this. I need to interject really quick. Extreme states are not Masonic, and that's going to be explained in the next duty. Um, the duty to other people. I know. So the duty to others is essentially to do well. In fact, it is, we might say it is one of the founding states of Freemasonry because the duty to others is particularly rooted around generosity and sharing. Now, you may say, well, Freemasonry is very secretive. Well, not really. You only think that because you're not there. If you haven't become a member, you would suspect that Freemasonry is very secretive. But in reality, that's not very much the case. But the duty to others is, in fact, a certain tier of charitable act. It is demanding and that it is a just thing from one individual to another to do what you can to assist them in life and make their life better. Within reason, of course, you're not supposed to destroy yourself over it. It's unbefitting to throw yourself by the wayside, we might say. Now, you can make certain sacrifices. That's not against anything. That's reasonable enough. But this is something that needs to be considered, is that we need to do what we can, but not break ourselves in the act. Which is, coincidentally, the final duty. The duty to the self. 
more particularly not in just keeping oneself alive and you know kicking and able to take care of your family but also to your own self-improvement in fact the idea of progress and emphasizing progressional development and being good to who we are is in a sense one of the original bases of Freemasonry because when we are good to ourselves and we are good to others and we are maintaining our devotion we might say collectively all these things are shown as a form of harmonious engagement when everything is met and when everyone is in a particularly humble balance people will be taken care of and we ourselves will be taken care of and in turn we hope that people have gone out of their way to keep to their theological doctrines such that they may find a both worldly and spiritual happiness because there is a balance there so we've basically broken the entire system so far you know uh we've hit on the fact that freemasonry doesn't have a religion we've hit on the fact that freemasonry emphasizes these three duties even if they don't say it directly this is what i have witnessed in terms of how i view freemasonry so I thought we'd tackle some of the big things that come in, uh, we might say, antithesis to what I've said in the title. <laughs> you know, uh, many people say uh, that Freemasonry has a specific religion because of a character called the Great Architect of the Universe. Now, this is referential. Some people will say, oh, well, what about the Demiurge? That's an architectural character. Yeah, I don't think they cared, though. If we look to, let's say, Kabbalah, the architect and the divinity are one and the same. To put distinction to try the divinity is in a sense an inherent dualism that creates a certain level of, we might say, ignorance. It reveals itself as a klepothic separation from the whole divinity. It is actually a metaphor for a very specific type of person. A dead person, spiritually speaking. This dead person is a person who believes that all the power in the world that he carries is of his own making and of his own accord, when in fact it is entirely belonging to the divinity. They can do things. For example, they can bless things. Let's look at the Catholics. You can bless an object. But from where does the blessing actually come? It comes from your action, yes, but your action actually creates, we might say, a cavity for spiritual involvement, and that spiritual involvement coming from the divinity is what actually blesses the object. Your action was simply a tool. So, the big Masonic thing, symbology. People are very uncomfortable about Masonic symbols, and I've yet to figure out exactly why that is. So. Masonic symbols actually have a dual purpose. They teach morals, but they also teach metaphysics. Because they're intrinsically just representations of something. They have a literal effect, and they have a metaphorical effect. And that metaphorical effect is split, as I mentioned earlier, into morals and metaphysics. Let's take a square. A square is actually quite a complex thing. It is the common sign of Freemasonry, you see the square encompasses. Does a square really teach you morals? In fact, it does if you think about it long enough. Because it's not telling you some secret gateway into doing well. It's reminding you to do well. To be fair and open. And the same goes metaphysically. What does a square teach us? It's quite a complicated matter, actually. A square shows that there is a certain level of harmonious balance in terms of how physical reality represents itself in the dimensions. And this balance is something that human beings have long been connected to. Because of our even animalistic basis, we have seen a desire for pattern recognition and for noting differentiations across the horizon, even going so far back as our hunter-gatherer bodies. So. We've touched on the morals and metaphysics of one symbol, but I guess we should do another for the sake of entertainment. Look at the two pillars. The two pillars are biblically based, right? And we might say that these two pillars have no real place in the world. We might say, oh yes, it's a Bible story. 
speaking of the pillars of King Solomon's temple. However, they do hold a variety of importance to us. On a physical and immediate level, they just represent human institution. The desire by man to make something in regards for that which he holds valuable and dear. And morally, quite succinctly and surprisingly, it teaches us not to lean too far to either side. And that it's not good to be so greatly good that we fail to have any sort of mediation. Or that we fall so much into our judgmental natures that we are harsh and fall flatly. Rather, we should walk the middle ground. Be balanced. Take time to consider things. Don't rush about being haphazard and reckless. Be contemplative. Which all falls back into the self-improvement mentioned earlier. Be contemplative. And that way you can better interact with divinity in our theological practices, with others, in raising our kids, or being good to friends, or knowing where to draw the line on bad habits and bad behaviors. And then, internally, we can also enact on those things with our own issues and our own developments. Which begs the question, well, what does that teach us metaphysically? Tons and tons of things. If you're interested in as above, so below, you've heard that phrase because it's so common now, or you're interested in uh, the earth and heaven and any sort of spiritual doctrine, that is pretty much the basis of all metaphysical situations. I'd like to bring up something that I call the Eternal March. At the beginning of the video, we asked ourselves, how old is Freemasonry? And I'd like to go ahead and make my point on what it is that I believe is the case. Masonry, by its definition and points prior mention, will technically never die and has always been, unless humanity itself ceases to exist or did not exist in the past, and every point in between is a symbol or a sign that is attributable to Masonic pursuit because it is the same pursuit as the existence and the beneficence of man between himself, others, and divinity. So let's get really wild for a second. What is the goal of Freemasonry? Not from its leaders or not from those who have attempted to answer the same question, but let's do it independently. Something rather uh, odd. Well, individually, they were the completion of the duties to do as best as one could within the three duties. Collectively, though, it is actually to be entirely done with the fickle and artificial issues of the world, such as tyranny, or war unending, or in short, just the stuff that comes with worldly living, in the sense that man falls to the animal that so subdues him. In a sense, it is his elevation that assists the world. And the thing is, is people um, have this belief that masonry is hyper reclusive about itself but again it simply isn't many of them are people that go to church with you <laughs> as fun as that is to think about uh, and they have no real doctrine or suppression of other people in fact i believe it's just one of the most openly accepting and worthwhile bodies that i've ever dealt with from personal experience <laughs> 